My name is Jim. I've been in and out of construction contracts for the last 17 years. Between those contracts, I do what I can to make a few extra bucks since you never really know when the next contract will actually show up. And unemployment pays you just enough to lay hungry awake at night. Most of us have heard of Uber or Lyft. I figured it was the perfect way to sustain my takeout burrito habit until the next work order. However, my driving record isn't exactly clean. I owe a few thousand dollars in fines for my DUI from three years ago. Before anyone goes up in arms, no one was injured and I wasn't in an accident. I was leaving the liquor store for the third time that afternoon and I was busted by a cop, waiting in the parking lot for me to wobble back to my car. It's pretty foolish considering that the liquor store is in walking distance, but my drunk brain was more concerned with being mugged than being caught by the police. Lesson learned, I'm sober now. Fatter from my oral fixation on Mexican food, but sober. When I failed to meet the requirements on Uber, I went searching online for something similar to ride sharing or some sort of P2P smartphone type of work. I came across an app called Cerber. I was reading one of those 10 ways to make money without bleeding out articles when I saw an advertisement for Cerber on both sides of the article. Big orange letters glowed against a black background with the phrase, hellish commutes made heavenly. I found that to be cheesy marketing, but since I'd never heard of this specific company before, I figured they were a startup and wouldn't be too picky about participants. I went ahead and started filling out a brief application, submitted it, and hoped for the best. This is where things started to get weird. Immediately after I hit submit, my phone rang. It was 11.47 p.m. when I pissed myself to the phone ringing. I looked at my phone to see unknown illuminating on the screen in my dimly lit bedroom. I didn't answer those calls during regular business hours, let alone during the late night. I decided to respect their privacy, ignore the call, and not bother to find out who was calling me. I shoved another taquito in my face and made my way towards my unmade bed. As soon as I dove into my flattened, stale pillows to begin my pity party, my phone rang again. It still said unknown, but it was now coming in as an emergency. Why? I answered the phone to a woman's voice filled with a cheerful disposition that had to be fueled by caffeine and cocaine. Hello, is this James Atwell? She chirped. Uh, yeah, who is this? Hi, this is Adlin with Cerber calling you back about the application you just submitted. Oh, um, I was still tonguing chicken taquito out of my teeth. Hi. That was awful fast. Did I submit it incorrectly? I said with a clear apprehension, but moderate enthusiasm. These folks were fast. No, not at all. I could hear her clicking her mouse as she spoke to me. I just wanted to alert you that we have reviewed your application and would like to know when you could start. Um, I struggled to get some pants on, cradling my phone between my ear and my shoulder. I finished buttoning up my pants and said, now I guess, are people active this late? Oh yes, our most active hours are between 10 p.m. and 4.30 a.m. She stops clicking her mouse. Please download the application onto your phone, quickly make a profile, and you'll be ready to receive requests. Do you have any questions? I can hear her smiling. Gross. Uh, no, I don't think so, I say as I finish zipping up my jacket. Wonderful, thank you for choosing Cerber. Give them hell, Jimmy boy. She hung up before I could respond. Give them hell? What the actual... Okay, well, no time to waste, I suppose. I download the app, making my profile, and mark myself as available. I drive a relatively new SUV, so I'm not exactly convinced I'll be first pick. Gas isn't cheap and everyone wants to save money. This means I have some time to clean up the taco foils and cardboard boats out of my car. About 20 minutes into trying to alleviate my car of the turgid smell of jalapeno and old cheese, I got my first ring. It was a ride request from one person, a man named Ray, seeking a ride to San Francisco. The city is about an hour from where he's requesting the ride, but a drive I'm very familiar with. I tap on accept, throw a bag of trash into the garbage bin, and start heading over to the planned location. To my surprise, I was directed to a neighborhood that was just a few blocks away from me. I parked outside a post-80s style suburban home, coated in sharp sparkle and salmon pink paint. From the door, I see Ray emerge from his pastel green door and immediately I knew something was off. Ray was obscenely tall. He had to be an easy seven and a half feet, slouching. He shoved his pallid hands into his pocket of his gray jacket. Hood pulled well over his head so that his face wouldn't be seen. His long, thin legs adorning blue jeans and clean black dress shoes carried his slender frame at a calm stride to my vehicle. As he came closer, I noticed he was wearing a tie and a formal jacket underneath his normal hoodie. Different strokes, I guess. He approached my window, his head down, and said, Jim? Yeah. You're Ray? He sounds so normal. This man is anything but. Yeah. Would it be too much trouble to ask you to fold the first row seats down for me? Because 
You know, he gestures below his torso to his knees, all while still keeping his head down. He didn't want me to see his face, but I didn't feel threatened by him, so I just ignored his lack of eye contact. Yeah, sure, no problem at all. He steps back so that I can open the door and access the back seat. Fold the first row of seats down so that the third row was the only one left in place to sit. Ray climbs in, takes his seat, and buckles up. Thanks, man. Of course. Bought this thing for comfort anyway, you know what I mean? I chuckled. He remained silent with his head facing out the window. Awkward. The silence of the drive was excruciating. I did my best not to spend too much time glancing back at him. He hardly moved. Every few minutes, he would uncross and recross his legs. My nervous tendencies finally got the best of me, and I had to be that dick. Those are some serious stems, I nervously chuckled. You play basketball as a kid? Maintaining his gaze out his window, he replies, That's a serious gut. You eat a lot of food? I got immediately defensive, but I brought this on myself, so I kept my mouth shut. Doesn't feel good, does it? Someone commenting on your size, he said so calmly. No, it doesn't. I apologize, I say through gritted teeth. I was no longer inspired to conjure up any more small talk for the duration of the ride. About 30 minutes later, we arrived at his destination, which led me to Old Fort Millie. I never recalled this place having an actual address. When my gaze was fixed on the location, dumbfounding me as to why anyone would want to be out here this late, he slowly got out of the car and closed the door. He kept his back to me and pulled out his phone and just started walking away. I was still very much so in the state of, what the hell? When I got a notification on my phone, he gave me five bat wings and a 20% tip, bringing the total to 1,279 and 37 cents. My jaw about hit my lap at the astronomical amount. As I brought my face up to try to stop him and alert him about there had been some sort of mistake, he just kept walking, put his hands up, and gave a gentle wave. I watched him until he was far into the trees before I finally looked down at my phone. He left a review written for the other riders that read, Go easy on him. He's new. The actual f- I sped home as fast as I could without tipping off any highway patrol. I ran inside my house, darted to my computer, and tried to make sense of what I just got myself into. To my chagrin, I couldn't find a single thing on the internet about server, not even a website. Beyond the application page, they offered through the advertisement. I sat back in my chair for a moment, my hands in my lap, and continued to process everything. Who pays that kind of money for an hour ride? Who the hell was in my car? What the hell was in my car? I grabbed my phone and opened the app again. Maybe something was there that could provide some sort of answer. Well, I found my answer. I clicked the menu option so that you could see where most of the applications are, and I found a description option, and it reads as follows. Server is a dedicated ride-sharing company that ensures anonymity and safe transportation of the paranormal. It goes on to talk about rates, amenities, and safety features. I never had a chance to read the terms and agreements. No one does. I went back to check everything I signed, and sure enough, it's a transport service for ghosts and stuff. The rates applicable to me are too good to pass up. Two-thirds of what it cost to pay my mortgage made in a matter of an hour. Maybe this is dangerous. Maybe it's absolutely insane, but I'm going to stick this out and see where it takes me. Well, predictably, I was not ready. Tonight had been insane. I got waterproof seat covers, let's face it, water is not a concern here, and salt-free snacks. I had a hard time finding a way to get finger foods, so I just got unsalted nuts and dried fruit. I had no clue what paranormal entities ate, so I just took a stab at it. I learned quickly that paranormal entities couldn't care less about almonds and dehydrated nectarines. Can't blame them. I tried my best to get in a good night's rest after that strange evening I had. Part of me was too shaken to sleep, and the other part was partial excitement on what the next ride would be like. I eventually gave up on sleep and just went to the general store to pick up snacks, water bottles, and seat covers. After coating my car in as much vinyl preventative measure as humanly possible, I treated myself to enchiladas and a cold Pepsi. After my meal, I felt accomplished enough to attempt sleep again. I was awoken by another unknown call again at 11.47 p.m. Doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out who was calling me. I eagerly picked up the call, nearly dropping my phone. I have questions. Adrenaline burst into a giggling hysteria and replied, Oh, I'm sure you do, Jim. What would you like to know? First off, I held a finger in the air, ignoring that I was on my phone call and not a physical confrontation. Why are you calling me so late? Well, last time we spoke, it was this exact time. You answered then, and I figured if I called you at the same time, you would answer at that exact time, she said calmly and slowly. Good point. Carried on with a false confidence, trying to pretend that I didn't feel as stupid as I sound. Second, I want to know if the payment I received was a mistake, I asked, chewing on my thumbnail. No, not at all. 
Was that not the proper compensation? It appears that Ray gave you a pretty generous tip. Would you like to file a dispute? I can hear her clicking her mouse again. No, I yelled on the phone. Most because I wouldn't want to see what's in store for anyone that pisses Ray off. I clear my throat and continue. No, sorry, I just feel like that maybe it was too generous. Why was the fee so high for Ray? I asked, kind of afraid of the answer. Jim, I assure you that the compensation was not an accident. Do you remember the part of the application that asked you if you had a spouse, relative, children, or friends? My heart found its way to its colon. I knew where this was going. Yeah, I remember. I practically croaked out my answer. My throat felt dry. Well, to put this as gently as I can, she stops clicking her mouse, the riders that you're transporting are not typical beings like yourself. Most of them are harmless, but some, insert long, unnecessary pregnant pause, can be dangerous. If something were to happen to you, we would prefer not to worry about liability lawsuits. It's not that your life bears little meaning, it's just business, Jim. I sit back and recall my answer. I have no one. I answered no to that part of the application. I let that answer sink in a little too long, and I heard Adeline chime in. Are you still with us, Jim? Did you have any more questions? Um, I close my eyes and try to gather my thoughts. Yeah. What sort of amenities and safety measures should I worry about? I asked, rubbing my very stressed out temple. We'll start with the uncomfortable topic about safety measures. Get the ugly out of the way. She begins with a soft yet sinister tone. You should get yourself an airtight container to hold sage and a lighter inside. Sometimes certain entities can leave behind an unseen residue. And the moment you feel a heaviness after your passenger has exited, you'll want to burn some in your vehicle until you can feel the tension is dispersed. I scurry to find a pad and pen to write it all down. She continues, you'll also want to invest in a raincoat or a poncho. A rain... Adeline, I asked in exasperation. Yes, Jim, a raincoat. I rolled my eyes and continued to make the list. Make sure you invest in a face mask, protective eyewear, and booties. You can never be too careful, she finishes. All right, I complete the rest of the recommended items and lists. Now, what about amenities? That depends on how willing you are to get your hands dirty for your riders. I could hear the smirk. Just how important is it to you to ensure that your riders receive the highest quality experience? Not very, I say defensively. I'm sure the government has already tapped into my line by now. I just want to drive and maybe not die. Extra steps sound like it could just tamper with that. She lets out a chortle. Is there anything else I can do for you, Jim? Uh, no. I feel now more confident than I did after picking up the call. Thanks, Adeline. No problem, Jimmy boy. Her sickening disposition returns as if it was so normal for her to work nights. Can we count on you to continue driving for us? I at the bedroom wall chewing on that question. Why shouldn't I? The money is right, the work is interesting, and I make my own hours. I would be an absolute fool to turn this down. The worst that happens is I die, and after discussing the pitiful state of my private life and lack of people therein, it doesn't seem so bad. Yes, I say, switching the phone from one ear to the next. Yeah, I'll keep driving for server. Wonderful, she exclaims. Good luck, and I'll be in touch. Thanks. Have a good night, Adel. And the line went dead before I could finish. It was already after midnight. It's time to get my ass into gear. I didn't have time to pick up the safety items. I survived without them last time, and I feel I'll get one more ride request on a Friday night. Safety gear is just going to have to wait. I park at a local donut shop that remains open 24 hours. It's not tacos, but I can get a churro there. Close enough. My phone dings with a request from someone named Borg, in a residential area just four minutes away. The final destination was a 12 minute ride to an old industrial building that I thought was shut down. I accept the request, dust the cinnamon sugar off my shirt and start driving. I'm instantly relieved when I see that the request didn't come from Ray. He was nice enough, but his potential is absolutely terrifying. I pulled to a very plain and vapid home. It was well kept with a brand new fence, just ordinary. So far so good. Then Borg walked out, again with the tall, he was a mammoth of a man, standing at least seven feet tall, jaw slack, with a large set of tusks weighing down massive jowls dripping with saliva. Borg was dragging a large hammer, wearing mild construction gear including a hard hat, tool belt, and cement-crusted boots. My eyes were wide, drawing in as much of this creature as my retinas could handle. Jim! He bellowed as if trying to call my attention from across four football fields. My body's still vibrating, I reply with, Borg? I didn't know what compelled me to be so risky as to yell at him, but my body was going rogue at this point. Yes, Borg. Borg opens the door with shocking delicacy, climbs into the back seat, 
accidentally slamming his hammer into his own foot. He didn't flinch, but I totally caught that. Bork stares at the back of my headrest, breathing like a hog with bronchitis. His breath was bad. Bad enough to gag a maggot. Just getting off work? I asked to try to stave off the wet snorting sounds from behind me. Yes. Borg build fence. Borg need beer. Oh, buddy. I can relate. Jesus, Borg, do you have a volume dial? Tone it down and break the knob off, for the love of God, I finally snapped. This is how I die. To my surprise, Borg lets out a thunderous cackle so loud that I'm sure it gave me prostate cancer. Jim funny. Borg like Jim. I give him a weak smile and decide to just focus my attention on the road. We were rounding the last turn of his trip. I pull up to the abandoned warehouse and it was just as dilapidated as I remember. The metal walls and roof were crusted in rust and wooden beams poking out of places with dry rot and patches of unkempt weeds swallowed up any semblance of a driveway. I come to a complete stop and Borg plunks his massive boots onto the gravel. He gracefully closes the door and walks over to my window. Thanks Jim, go sleep. Jim, look bad. Are you fucking kidding me? Good night, Borg. Go sleep. Borg too loud. I bark at him with a grin. He grins back and begins his short, seemingly painful walk to the front doors of the building. I caught myself half smiling as the door shut to his murky mansion, when it was violently interrupted by the realization that Borg had admitted a smell, and it had not followed him out of the car. Oh no. This is so bad. I quickly drive to a nearby gas station and assess the damage. This giant, sticky man-fetus was making all that noise for a reason. He literally shit his own pants in the backseat of my car, and his internal matter leaked everywhere, leaving big, Borg butt-cheek imprints. My night was clearly shot. I bought some paper towels, bleach, air fresheners, and a few taquitos from the gas station I stopped at. It took me two full hours to clean this hazardous waste out of my car, but I was able to alleviate the blasphemous evidence from my back seat. It was around 3.52 a.m. when I finished, and I remember Adeline saying that the highest hours of operation ended around 4.30 a.m. So I went ahead and put out a ready signal to try to salvage the night. How I wish I would have gotten Ray instead. Anything else would have been better than this traumatizing experience. Got another ping almost instantly after putting out the signal. At least I had another fat payout to look forward to. Then I noticed something strange. The request was coming from the very gas station I was already parked at, from someone named Angela. Stranger still, there was no destination that followed. Albeit bizarre, I figured it was an app malfunction. I accepted the request anyways. Immediately after accepting, my back door opened and shut so quickly that it sounded like one fluid motion. Hi, James. The voice. There's no way. My blood instantly turns to ice. My body starts shaking violently. This isn't happening. It can't be real. I turn my head slowly, shuddering at the woman who sat in the back seat. My horrified gaze met her milky eyes, shattering my senses like glass. All the terror, sadness, and despair I have encountered in my life is incomparable to what I was feeling at that very moment. Tears involuntarily streamed down my face, my mouth hanging open, hands tensed into fists on the steering wheel, white-knuckling my grip as I may have been ripped through the roof of my car. This isn't real. Can't be real. The request came from my dead sister, Angela. Angela died at the age of 24. I was 28. My sister was tiny, intelligent, nerdy, and an independent woman who prided herself on her ability to quote every scripture in the Bible in a non-denominational way, while also being able to recite every Greek god, their spouse, children, and histories therein. She had a natural curiosity for stories, sincere compassion for the voiceless, and loved her family deeply. Angela never missed a single Christmas dinner. She was working on her doctorate in international mythology when she died. You all thought that a philosophy degree was useless. Angela and I were very close. The four of us as a unit had a very healthy relationship and could always rely on each other. We kept our circle small and tight. Her body was found dumped on the side of Highway 5 and was in terrible condition. For those of you with weak constitutions, you might want to skip over this. Basically, things had happened to her. And with instruments that involved slicing holiday ham. Her head was almost entirely severed from her shoulders Appendages were found in a black garbage bag placed right next to her corpse. Stranger still, her cause of death was not due to any of those fatal blows. She was hot shotted with heroin and was dead before the massacre could even have taken place. The reason they know this is because when a body dies, blood coagulates and takes on a viscous texture, causing blood to pass through those veins and arteries at a much slower rate. Paracoagulation with a stopped heart, no longer able to circulate and pump blood, 
you get a very minimal mess and very little blood splatter. Perhaps the most ominous and puzzling part was that she was found wearing a necklace no one in the family recognized. A small silver bullet dangled from a delicate silver chain. It was like an anti-trophy, a clean breakaway from a typical psychopath. This person was a sadistic showman, and they meant to confuse and bring an unreasonably high shock value to anyone who had stumbled upon the knowledge of this crime. And it worked. The case grew cold, and it has been reopened since. None of us ever got closure from her death. Just two years after we buried her, her parents committed suicide. They locked themselves in the garage and doused themselves in gasoline and lit themselves in fire. They were found still holding hands with no sign of struggle. The death of my parents didn't affect me as bad as Angela's death did, though. You expect your parents to expire. You don't expect your baby sister to be slaughtered. No one is ever ready for a call like that. My baby sister, the one who intentionally got a job at a bookstore to sneak books out simply to learn, was gone. Any hope and good that was left in me was buried along with her. I traded in the notions of starting my own family for a more tangible future in alcoholism. My baggage was exhausting enough for me. There's no reason to subject that sort of madness any further. The gnawing pain eventually went numb and formed invisible mental scar tissue to cover up any residual damage from the impact. And here she was, staring at me with a vacant expression from the back seat of my car. I jumped into the back seat and hugged her tight, sobbing for several minutes, while she tried to hush me as though we were being watched. James, please. She said, trying to quell the inconsolable teenager I was at that moment. I need your help. I immediately shot back, grabbing her arms. I thought I would never see you again, Angela. It's been ten years, I said, gathering my composure. I know. She looked down in her lap, trying to hide her own pain. I'm sorry, I would have come sooner. I cut her off, resting my hands on my own lap, and said, Wait. Why now? She looked back up at me and said, I would have come sooner, but you were self-destructing. Seeing ghosts would only amplify that sort of behavior, so I watched from afar. Okay, I nodded, looking past the milky desaturation of her eyes and into her now very present soul. I can understand that, but you are here now. What exactly do you need help with? Her face became stern, replying with, I messed up. You know how I was studying black masses, occultism, and ritualistic spiritualism? I nodded and she continued. Well, I was turning up empty-handed on every path I traveled, so I dug deeper. She became uncomfortable and shifted in her seat. I decided to go through the dark web to find what I could on summoning entities. I eventually came in contact with a man who only referred to himself as Wade. She turned her face to the back of my seat and shut her eyes as if she had to scrape to the bottom of her cerebellum to recall the next few steps. He claimed that he could summon Baphomet and that he could perform such summons for me. However, I already knew that a Baphomet could not be summoned, so he was either going to make a huge fool of himself, or I was going to witness one of the most intelligent entities ever written about. Both results would have been fruitful for my research. I was so concerned with just wanting more experience, I never stopped to evaluate the risks. She let herself chew on that for a moment. She looked like she was truly checking out of the conversation, so I softly spoke. Angela. She shook her head, bringing herself back into the discussion. I'm fine. She pushed her hair back, and that's when I saw the giant dark bruise with a tiny hole in the center of it. Like an eerie halo. I chose to ignore it for now because I was growing impatient and wanted her to wrap it up. We met at a coffee shop close to where I lived, and he drove us two hours out of the way with what looked like a barely standing building, light still flickering inside. We walked in, and he instructed me to take my shoes and coat off. When I was done taking my second shoe off, I blacked out. I'm not sure how long I was out or what delivered me to being unconscious, but I woke up clearly drugged. It was heroin, I interrupted. The cops told us you were hot-shotted, and that's how you died. They told us that you were not an addict since you didn't have any other physical distress from active use. Yeah, she rubbed her neck, staring forward. Well, he didn't kill me right away. He put an IV directly into my neck and delivered it slowly enough to keep me tranquilized first. A clear expression of rage swept over her face. But her voice was still calm. I woke up in what looked like a mortuary. I was on an old metal gurney, sustained by leather straps. That wasn't even necessary. I couldn't even lift my head, let alone escape. I knew I was going to die. I was just afraid it wasn't going to be quick. He told me that I was stupid for seeking dark answers to dark questions and that my demise was entirely my fault. He wasn't wrong. I put myself in that exact position. I felt foolish. I should have known that summoning a Baphomet wasn't possible and that should have been enough to raise some red flags. I rolled my eyes at the last part. Nerd alert. 
He told me that my death was important regardless of how I had arrived at this situation, she continued, her voice taking on a monotonous inflection. He said that he wasn't even part of any religious sector, that he was a one-man worship, and that it was because he was a true god among men. Her mouth curled up in a slight smirk, and she said, I verbally retaliated, though. My last words before he mainlined China right into my juggler were, I thought gods were perfect. You must have mustard on your shirt, and you reek of a dollar store aftershave. You're not a god. You just suffer from narcissistic personality disorder. She cackled at her own remark. I wanted to cry just watching her reflect any sort of positive feeling. I missed her so much. Well, that pissed him off enough to end it, she said half-smiling. I hope it brings you some sort of peace knowing that I didn't suffer. I nodded and replied, it does, but what exactly do you need my help with? Well, I want you to find him, I guess, she shrugged. I'm not his first and only victim. I'm not exactly sure what I want you to do once you do find him, but I want you to stop his psychotic church of self agenda. Do you have any sort of lead you can give me? I asked eagerly. Maybe she wasn't sure what to do after he was found, but I had a few ideas. I may even call Ray for help. It's been 10 years, she said, looking directly into my eyes. But I do remember where the location was, the funeral home that I died in. My hand started shaking, my breath trembling. Where was this exactly? It was then I heard my server notification chime. She finally added the destination to the ride that she had requested. I looked at my phone resting on the dash to her. She was smiling, such a warm, lovely smile for being so dead. What do you say, James? She lifted her finger, pointing at my phone. Shall we begin? My body fled with pinpricks and pure adrenaline. Hell yeah. I jumped to my front seat. I've been waiting for 10 years. We started driving down I-5 South. We had a three-hour journey ahead of us. The tip better be fat. Angel and I spent the ride in relative silence for the first hour. Something wasn't sitting right with me. When telling me she wanted me to find him, my mind was too focused on the possibility of torturing this crackhead that killed my sister, I almost missed the last part. Angela. My inquisition sliced through the quiet hum of the tires and penetrated her gaze on the road. Yeah? She was holding herself as she was cold. There's something bugging me, I say tapping my thumb on the steering wheel. What's up? No sign of a guilty conscience, and I'm not sure I felt comforted by that notion. When you said find him, I guess. What exactly does that mean? What do you mean, you guess? I was trying to hide the accusatory tone, but I've always been terrible with composing myself. Well, I don't really know. I feel like finding him and resolving therein may allow me to leave this purgatory of just walking around the living, you know? Unfinished ghost business? She genuinely sounded theoretical. You mean you don't know, still sounding like I'm interrogating her? I can't help it. I've seen some weird shit, and since she's my sister, I feel like I can ask away, no bars hold. Strange, isn't it, she says, cocking her head to the side, allowing her eyes to do what I assumed was a blank stare. Her peepers didn't creep me out until then. You would think that dying delivers a sense of clarity or answers some questions. It's just not the case. Dying is like exiting scene one and walking into a different set, in a different costume, and unrehearsed lines. It's confusing. I've read a lot about souls being trapped because of unfinished business, and I can't help but think I'll be closer to resting if I try every avenue, no matter how cliche it sounds. My heart crawled into my throat, choking me with sadness. I just got her back and she's already trying to leave. I try to soften the moon and say, well, why do you even want to go to heaven? There's no affirmation in the Bible that says there will be tacos on the other side. Why chance it? I don't even know if heaven's real. I know that isn't necessarily my eternity, but Heaven could just be a fairy tale for all I know. Damn it. That backfired, now I feel worse. So you're saying that, what? Your soul just dissipates? Still swallowing as much sorrow as I could? That's not what I'm saying, she almost sounded annoyed. I'm not sure if my stupid questions are irritating her or if she's irritated with her own lack of answers. I'm saying I don't know. I'm saying that I do know that I'm stuck and I don't know what the next step is or what arrives thereafter. She stares out the window concluding this discussion. I may suck at reading women, but I could tell I wore out the topic. I left her well enough alone, grabbed another cold gas station taquito, and munched in silence. Sort of. So crunchy. Even cold. My phone dinged with another server notification. I squinted at the request to share a ride with the current passenger. I guess even the supernatural care about the environment too. 
Makes sense, they're typically immortal and live longer than humans anyways. Being mindful of cutting back where you can is never a bad idea. They may also just be as cheap as my sister too, who knows? Hey Angela, someone wants to share a ride for about 15 minutes, is that cool? She nodded, still brooding in her own nerdy and dramatic state of despair. I hit the accept to someone named Siobhan. I pulled up to a lake that was pinned in the request. Standing there was a gorgeous woman, long red hair, waxen skin, and a black dress that only revealed her head, hands, and shoes. She was a petite little thing, which I thought would be a relief. She looked way too normal. Siobhan climbed in the back seat and said, Thank you. I didn't think drivers were ever in this area. She flashed a sweet smile and buckled her seatbelt. She looks like a human, but humans are definitely not allowed to use server, so what is she? This wouldn't typically bother me if she had like a third eye or a protruding underbite or maybe just razor sharp teeth, but she just looked like the average commuter. And that was unsettling in this very specific circumstance. I can't say that they are, I just happen to be in the area, I said staring at her through my rear view window. Angel seemed to be fairly unfettered by the new passenger. She had nothing to contribute. I pulled back onto the freeway, glancing every few seconds to see a smiling Siobhan, looking back at me. She's likely under the impression that I'm thinking of a decent pickup line. In actuality, I was just trying to read the room a bit to see if it was appropriate to ask possibly the dumbest question I've ever verbally vomited. So, uh, what are you? I asked. What's that supposed to mean? She asked so defensively. I mean, like, what kind of thing are you? You look way too normal to be using server, so what are you? It would take an expert team of surgeons from France to remove the foot I just shoved down my own throat. If you can believe it, I was entirely shameless in my questioning. My sister was clearly appalled, since she turned her head towards me, mouth agape in utter horror. If she didn't look so dead, it would have been funny. However, she looked very dead, and that caused my body to visibly shudder. What are you talking about? I'm clearly a beautiful woman, Siobhan all but screamed at me. Yeah, James, shut all the way the fuck up, my sister hissed through her freaky postmortem teeth. What? I asked, thinking my question was perfectly valid. I should have guessed that Angela knew something that I didn't by her reaction. I should have stopped there, apologized, waited until Siobhan exited my car, and asked Angela what the big deal was. But I didn't. Oops. Big oops. From the back seat, I could hear gurgling and panting. I looked in the mirror to see that Siobhan was shaking violently and her skin was bubbling. It looked like black billiard balls were crawling violently under her epidermis. Her eyes took on a bright yellow, a rectangular iris forming around like that of a goat or frog. God damn it, James. Now you've done it, Angela yells in a panic, wincing and huddling by the car door. It looked like she was trying to brace herself for a detonation. Well, I guess technically she was. Siobhan's face started to stretch, her face forming a long, horse-like muzzle. Her arms wiggled into a transition of black tentacles, writhing and rapidly becoming longer. Her long red hair morphed into wet obsidian strands. She looked like a horse octopus. Between glances of the road and my rearview mirror, her physical being became far more atrocious and I couldn't help but autopilot my way down I-5 in the meantime. I could see her chest heaving and falling with every snort of hot breath. She went from being this tiny doll to being a massive mess of tendrils behind a set of glowing eyes. She quite literally filled up most of the car. Wh what the hell are you, lady? My voice cracked as if I was 16 again. That sort of sight will suck the masculinity right out of you and make you a mouse in no time flat. A sharp bray escaped her horse-like lips and caused me to lose hearing. I could see that Angela was trying to bark the answer at me. What? I asked, hearing my own heavily muffled reply. She's a Kelpie! Angela screams, throwing her hands up. Fuck is a- I finished my question before one of Siobhan's slimy tentacles plunged its way into my mouth. As if I hadn't humiliated myself enough with my tone-deaf night of interrogations, I subjected myself to real-life hentai on top of that. Super. I take one hand off the wheel and try to yank the tentacle out of my throat, swerving at 75 miles per hour in a frenzied panic. Another appendage wrapped around my chest, my throat, and my left leg. As if my stupidity wasn't done controlling the events of this evening enough, I decided to let go of the steering wheel entirely to get a better grip. Bigger oops. I was losing consciousness and strength quickly. I haven't been able to breathe for a good two minutes now, and with a surging adrenaline rush to try to stay alive, my legs involuntarily stiffened to find leverage. On the gas pedal. Of course. Biggest oops. 
I found myself speeding down the highway, wrestling with a pissed off ponypus, trying desperately to stay alive, and crashed my tank of an SUV into a ditch. Though it was extremely dangerous and entirely unintentional, totaling my vehicle is what saved my life. I blacked out temporarily and woke up to an uncomfortable stillness that followed the car accident. I could hear Siobhan breathing quickly in the back seat, and it sounded like that's all she was doing. I slowly look back, blood trickling into one eye, and see that she's still knocked out. After feeling relief wash over me, I was hit with an overwhelming amount of pain from the impact, as well as an overexertion from defending my airway. I crawled out of my car and dropped to the ground directly onto my back, knocking the wind out of my already fragile chest. I gripped my shoulder and let out a man's groan. I lay as flat as possible, looking up, trying to mind too much movement of my neck and back. Angela pokes my face into my vision directly above my body, and I ask her to get my phone. Angela hands me my phone, and I tap on the emergency number, bringing the phone up to my ear. Hi, Jim. It appears you've been in an accident. It's Adeline with her annoying, jovial voice. I'm sending two drivers to your location, both equipped with server-employed physicians. I assume your sister will be joining you. It's that bitch. I'm agitated and grateful all at once. Yeah, I choke out to her. Have him pick up three tacos, a burrito with extra nacho cheese, and a bottle of uh, acetaminophen. You're buying. I drop my arm to my side and allow myself to pass out. I wake up four hours later, suffering a very minor concussion, a shattered esophagus, and some bruising on my bones. We were put up in a mediocre hotel room stocked with an obscene amount of Mexican food and a tall bottle of heavy painkillers. I sit up, knock the painkillers off my nightstand, and grab a burrito. Alcoholics shouldn't touch opioids. I already knew that. I'll pat myself on the back for that one responsible decision I made by stuffing my face with my favorite addiction. I quietly ate my burrito in bed and glanced over at Angela. She was sitting in a dusty rose slipper chair, arms folded and staring at the ceiling with her legs crossed. I looked back down at my burrito and allowed myself to bathe in shame for my irresponsible lack of couth. The disheartening fact that I almost died in two different ways in a matter of five minutes was startling and blanketed me like a guilt quilt. I messed up bad tonight and I'm due for a round of penance. I'm sorry, I say with my mouth full of burrito innards. I wasn't thinking properly and I put us into a dangerous situation. She raised her hand at me, gesturing for me to quit while I'm ahead. I listened this time, mostly because my mouth was full. I'm already dead, doofus, she calmly reminded me as she continued to stare off at the ceiling. I wasn't in any danger at all. There's seriously no need to apologize. All right, I say emotionally wounded. Where's my car? You totaled it, James. We're going to be stuck here for a few days until Cerber can iron out the details with your insurance. Adeline called me and filled me in on the process, and she said that she's going to take care of it. There's nothing that can be done for at least two days. So focus on healing. We waited 10 years. We can wait two more days. Her disposition softened, trying to soothe me. Okay, I continue eating my burrito, reflecting on the antics of the evening. Angela? What? She asked if she was prepared for another blow of foolhardy questions. What the fuck is a kelp pie? I was a complete ass to Siobhan, and I apologized to her. I added $1,000 of my own cash to her server account. Sadly, that only gets her as far as four blocks. She was gracious about it, Subban apologized for power fisting my throat, and I told her that she had no reason to be sorry, and we ended our call on a good note. She gave me four bat wings and a review that read, He's cute, for a Neanderthal. I'd ride him again. Which was beyond kind of her, but now I'm not so sure if she's pissed or flirting. Both, maybe. I will continue to do my best at keeping my mouth closed. My social ineptitude is staggering but I'm learning a very valuable lesson in humility. Not much transpired the first day. I didn't have insurance through Cerber, and the agents that handle my claims specifically are human. Adeline is having a wicked hard time finding an in with the company that I'm insured with. She says that if it takes more than a week, they'll just replace my car altogether and terminate the claims. Why they just don't do that anyways, who knows? Maybe it's her way of ensuring that I stay in one place and heal as best I can. She could just be putting it off to practice a little damage control. Something tells me it's the latter. Server put us up with some pretty good accommodations. Angela has been pretty much balls deep in books for days now, trying to figure out what the silver bullet could possibly mean. She thinks that if we find its meaning, then we can find the origin of Wade's beliefs. If we find the origin, we can combat them properly. I'm not sure how useful I'll be in that situation, but even if it is just a front row seat to watch her haul off on Wade, well, I'll be satisfied. Accommodations also include an unhealthy enablement of my Mexican food obsession 
as well as my personal nurse and doctor. They're both black-eyed people, which I'm not entirely sure what that is, but they're nice enough. Probably the tamest entities that I've been around. Fun fact, paranormal medicine is a thing and it's incredible. My esophagus, concussion, and superficial injuries have completely healed. Get this, they were able to inject a rapid healing medication that was taken from a strain of werewolf flu. I look and feel like I may stand a chance of talking shit to a Kelpie again. Kidding. Sort of. I spent a lot of time talking to Borg on the phone. I guess he caught wind of the accident and was disheartened by it. Ironically, he sent over an iron nail. It was delivered to me in a tiny green box with a note that read, Borg sorry Jim got mouth violated. Borg send iron nail. Good for fence. Good for Kelpie. What started as a gratitude phone call turned into a construction shop talk on a few occasions. Borg like Jim, Jim like Borg. On the second day in, I woke up at 2am to Angela's face about an inch away from mine. I flew up onto my bed like a weird sheet surfer screaming nothing intelligible with my hands above my head, spider monkey style. Plucked down on the bed, gripping my chest and said, what Angela? Talk a lot of shit for someone who startles so easily, she says slightly amused. I have found plenty on the silver bullet, but nothing that makes any sense. She walks over to one of the many books she has littering on the floor of our room. Alright, I swing my legs over the side of the bed, placing my hands in my lap. So what have you found then? Can we use it against Wade in any way? Not that I can tell, no, she says looking down at her book. I'm only finding ways to defeat evil entities with silver bullets, nothing that says how they're used to aid them. And this is assuming, of course, that Wade is evil. Excuse me, if? I ask, completely bewildered. Yes, if. Just because he killed me does not mean he's evil, she said so confidently. Okay, I'm lost. What part of murder is not evil? I ask, my head spinning. Murder to you, sacrifice to another, martyrdom to another. Death isn't always meant to be sinister. Just because I didn't want to die doesn't make his objective evil. We may have been going about this the wrong way the whole time. Angela sat on the floor with her legs crossed, putting her head into her cupped hands. So you're thinking this is some sort of protection doodad, I ask. I guess. She folds her arms tight against her chest. I'm still not entirely sure. We may have to just fly into this blind. I would suggest contacting a priest, but given your line of work, it could tarnish anything you have left of your credibility among the paranormal. Throw both fists up and gave her the double bird special. Okay, on that note, I'm going back to sleep. As soon as my head hits the pillow, the hotel line rings. Throw a bit of a flailing tantrum before picking up the phone. On the other end, I can hear only a faint rustling of what sounded like the wind. Uh, hello? I ask, looking at my sister with one eyebrow raised. Hi, James. It's a man who sounded like a cat that ate a canary. That's when I noticed that Angela is violently shaking, cowering against the corner of our room, eyes welling up. Who is this? I ask the man with a hint of concern in my disposition. I hear you're looking for me says in a smooth as cream voice. I'm Wade. Son of a bitch. Bet your sorry ass I'm looking for you. I scream into the receiver. Pure rage surged its way through every nerve of my body like I was being electrocuted with blind madness. Calm yourself, child. Now he definitely sounded condescending. You'll get the chance. I'm in need of a ride. Do you happen to have time for a request? Oh, our little bitch is considered paranormal now? That's news to me. Thought cowards like you had a super cool fan club that congregates in basements for pre-murder circle jerks. Does that come before or after fucking your mom? Sorry folks, I tried, but let's face it, he had that coming. And I'm sure a lot of you would be disappointed in me for not properly tearing this dick wart to shreds. He laughed in an unsettling manner. Oh child, you know not the dire situation you've stumbled into. I clenched my teeth. Blood boiling so hot that I can feel myself sweat as he continues. That's fine. In due time, I suppose. In the meantime, please respond to my request. I'll be waiting. The line goes dead. I waste no time and call Adeline immediately. She picks up the phone and starts with James, panic shrouding her voice. I don't want to hear Adeline. I get dressed, putting the iron nail in my pocket. Get me a car, now. I don't give a damn what it is. Get the car out front. James, I'm not above begging. Please don't. Car, now, I scream as I hang up. Angela, we're going for... I stop and come to the startling realization that Angela isn't in the room anymore. I frantically race to my phone, ignoring the server notifications, and try calling her. My calls went straight to voicemail. I can feel my torso caving in, anxiety rushing over my body. I must have her. I don't know how, but my intuition is telling me that he somehow has her. I run down to the front desk of the hotel, finding a silver plate holding a set of keys and a note from Adeline that reads... Please, in the name of all things holy, don't do this. 
I swipe the keys and rush out to find a standard black luxury sedan waiting for me. I all but fly into the front seat, turn the ignition, and mount my phone onto the dash. I tap the server app and buckle up as it loads. My sister is gone. I'm armed with absolutely no useful information nor any weapons. I can't just let this opportunity slip, especially with my sister being held hostage. I'm rushing into this situation with my presence and good intentions only. This is how he wanted it though. I had no time to waste. Server booted up the request homepage with one notification already three minutes old. I tap accept. Gotcha, asshole. I say as I accept the request from Archangel Michael. The location to pick up Michael was a shanty little bar that looked like it allowed indoor smoking and turned a blind eye to quaaludes. Michael was dressed in cowboy boots with an adorable matching hat, a pastel orange western style shirt, and a very neat blue jeans. He resembled either a cop or someone who was trying to be a cowboy for the very first time. Kind of like those Scandinavian folks who are obsessed with westerns and intentionally go to the Alamo without a field trip slip. Westerns are boring and I'm not sorry for saying it. He almost anxiously got to the front passenger seat of my car. His apprehensive nature completely negates what I heard on the phone. Goody, more weird shit that doesn't make sense. Maybe I'm just too simple, who knows. He gets into my car and I look at him like I'm expecting the first swing. Up close he looks exhausted in the middle of an existential crisis. I did not want to relate to this weirdo. You the asshole? I ask, completely ready to die. It's inevitable in this line of work. Are you the intellectual? Oh right, you're the dumbass that is about as well-mannered as a toddler riled up on Red Bull. Oh my god, he is me. I think I'm in love. Who are you? I ask, completely befuddled. I wanted to kill this guy just two minutes ago, very slowly. Now I kind of want to take him inside for a beer. Now, you can't read either. How do they even let you have a license? In fact, how are you even still alive? He gave me this crazy wide-eye expression, leaning his face entirely too close to mine. Oh, and yes. He did sound like a genuine cowboy. Are you just going to keep asking me unhelpful questions, or are you going to play ball and tell me what in tarnation is going on? Yeah, I mocked him. We're in love now, it's okay. Alright, I'm not Wade. I'm Michael, the Archangel. I'm not going to waste any more of your time. We have shit to do, son. He said, pointing to my mounted phone. On the screen was a destination in a residential area. A nice neighborhood. That doesn't settle me in any way. Rich people are creeps, worse than my passengers. Self-made monsters. Terrific. While we make our way there, you mind telling me why you decided to intercept my very well-earned date with death and dismay? I asked, less pushy. Despite enjoying this back-and-forth banter, I figured it was a bad idea to piss off an angel responsible for assembling victorious ethereal armies. I may be sassy, but I promise I'm not as stupid as I look. I don't care about dying, but no one is actually trying to earn a fast track to hell. Divination, son. What does it look like? He asked, putting a poorly handmade cigarette in his mouth. You're about to go march into your death, and you have the balls to think you've got the balls for it. Um, what? I ignored the fact that he lit a cigarette up in my car, which is typically a no-no, since this is technically a company car, and I'm still pissed at Adeline. Alright, I need to re-examine the facts. You're an angel, right? As in one of THE angels? Yeah. He took a long, heroic drag of his cigarette and continued. And I'm here to save your sorry ass. You're about to tangle with a lone skinwalker, he raises his eyebrows at me. The Native American myth? I guess I shouldn't call it a myth at this juncture. That's right. What's dangerous about a lone skinwalker is that they have been cast out of their tribe. They're only 150 years old. Very young. Yeah, well, he's basically a fetus, I said rolling my eyes. No, you would be a fetus in this situation. There are skinwalkers that are nearly as old as me. I immediately wanted to ask how old he was, but I thought better of it. The reason he is so dangerous is that he's lawless, not bound to any tribal rules. Those skinwalkers have little of those to begin with. I impatiently tap my thumb on the steering wheel, now slightly excited to land at our next stop. I think I know what's coming. Since you're too bullheaded to back down and too stupid to handle this alone, I decide to help you out. He grins, showing a couple of gold cap teeth and radiating confidence. In turn, I also felt confident. Thanks. Now where are we? I asked, putting my car into park and killing the ignition. I have a guy who keeps everything you need right here in his home. Can't exactly run a store with this type of material on account of licensing being a necessity in this state. Some folks just need to handle an advanced problem just one time. He unbuckles the seatbelt and climbs out of the car. Michael doesn't bother knocking on the door and enters the home. Every room was unburdened by furniture as well as a lack of lighting. We head down to the basement, which was lit with a light violet, bathing the room in an emotional shade of calm. 
Littered about the room, which I can only describe as an organized mess of different types of weapons, stood a drag queen. Yep, very clearly a drag queen. The only reason I could even guess that this was the cartoon-inspired makeup and a wig that looked like it could be of a living creature piled high on his head, from the neck down, he was dressed in a skin-tight tracksuit, exposing his well-kept physique. I know. Keep your mouth shut, Jim. Azazel, I brought this kid with the mouth on him, Michael says, pointing behind himself at me. In the most flamboyant voice imaginable, Zazel replies, Hey honey, you're dancing with a skinwalker? Zazel does a mild salsa dance behind his workbench. So I'm told I'm trying to remain professional because not only am I standing in the presence of an archangel, but the drag queen standing before me is a demon. I know what a Zazel is. Okay, so I'm going to give you a 9mm handgun, two 11 round magazines of pure silver, a Molotov cocktail, and a lighter. Now, you can't kill a skinwalker with silver. It'll only slow it down. Do your best to aim for his legs and arms. When Skinwalker dumps its human form, it'll have freakishly quick abilities in both arms and legs. So, don't skip any limbs. By the time Azazel was finished giving me these directions, he had piled everything into a backpack. I'm sorry I have to ask. Both Michael and Azazel were looking at me as though I was burdening them. Angels and demons work together? Fallen, asshole. I'm fallen. Azazel crosses his arm glaring at me. Right. You guys actually work together? I ask. Yes, Michael replies. Fallen were angels once too. Not all demons have bad intentions. Some like humans quite a lot and want to maintain a sort of balance. All right, I grabbed the backpack completely done with this religious topic. You mind fixing the interception, Michael? I would really like to finish this. Sure, kid. It was Azazel and we begin our ascent from the basement. One more thing, Jim, says Azazel, waving. Don't miss. You can't afford to miss. I nod with a smile and say, thanks, Azazel. He smiles and then turns around to finish his original project. As we were walking back to the car, I rehearsed my plan in my mind. I'd never actually shot a firearm before, so this was going to be interesting. I also never had to huck a Molotov cocktail before. I may actually die trying to kill this thing. Michael and I get back into the car and I ask him, All right, I have to know, why is Azazel a drag queen? Michael let out a single chuckle and said, Well, Azazel was cast out of heaven for teaching humans how to build weapons and put war makeup on. He's always enjoyed cosmetics, so he decided to make it a hobby. Sounds reasonable, I said with a genuine nod. So, what does Wade want? Obviously, Michael has answers. I'm not going to be shy about asking. Not that I ever had a problem with that to begin with. Michael pulls out another shanty stogie, lights it up and gets comfortable. Do you remember what it was like losing Angela? How you felt lost and empty and your life just had less flavor? Yes, I replied. Well, when some folks lose their sense of home in their people, they begin grieving in one or two common ways. Some become hollow, much like you. Some become angry and develop an insidious agenda. They hurt others to gain control of their own pain, Michael says, never breaking eye contact. So why Angela, I ask? Victim of circumstance, son. She's special, but she's not that special, he replied. An idea as to why there was a silver bullet hanging from her body? What about the insanity parade he conducted on her corpse? I'm angry now, not at Michael. I haven't had a taco in several hours. I put the bullet there. I was hoping that someone would have caught on to that clue. Of course, that was a bust. He takes another drag of a cigarette. The mutilation was pure rage. He's lost and upset. That's why he killed Angela before he had his fun with her. Watch it, Michael, I said swiftly. My sister isn't a sideshow attraction. Easy, son, he said calmly. I was actually hoping to piss him off. Point being is, he didn't have a reason. The whole point of all this is he's just doing vile things out of rage. I was entirely unsatisfied with that answer. It's one thing to murder someone with intent, but to entirely disregard all life over a temper tantrum is a whole other level of evil. Do you know where Angela is? I asked. She's home, kid, I said pointing upward. Her time here was served. She brought you to where you needed to be, so it was time for her to return. The oxygen in every fiber of my being was sucked right out of my body. Oh, sorry kid, puts one hand on my shoulder and squeeze. We all go home at some point, that's just how it is. Yeah, I croaked. What was the point of even going after this thing now? The only reason I got involved was to help Angela cross over. She's done that now. Listen, I know you're probably thinking of quitting. Would you honestly want this to happen to another young lady? A child? He asked me gently. Put way too much faith in my integrity. I shook my head scoffing. But no. I don't want this to happen to anyone else. I'm going to finish this. Good, Michael said, patting me on the shoulder. 
We spent the rest of the ride in silence while Michael chain-smoked. I continued to rehearse my plan, and I was losing my confidence with every repetition. Maim and set on fire. Maim and set on fire. Maim and set on fire. Pull up in front of the bar I had originally picked Michael up from. Since Michael was not a danger to me in the slightest, his ride ended up being free. That's fine. I was in no position to pout about finances after the free gear to roast my sister's killer. Michael gets out of the car and rounds his way to my window. You gotta lay off the Mexican food, son. It'll kill you. Smiled half and then walked away. Thanks, Michael, I replied, watching him walk into the bar. I saw that the job was far too much for me. I couldn't possibly do this. Well, not alone. I exit the cyber app and decide to make a phone call. Jim? Borg barks into the phone. Borg, I replied, attempting to match his gusto. Hi, Jim. Feeling better? I can literally hear his tusks scraping the phone as he spoke. Yeah, thanks, Borg. Put my backpack arsenal in the back seat. Feel like taking down a skinwalker with me tonight? Borg hates skinwalker. Borg help. Jim have right protection? Jim stupid. Borg have to ask. That gelatinous, jovial dick. Yes, Borg, I say, trying to remember his honesty isn't personal. I have a silver bullets and a Molotov. Okay, Jim. Only fire kill Skinwalker. Borg wrestle for Jim. I could hear whatever poor recliner he was ascending from cry out as he stood. Thanks, Borg. One more thing, I add. Yes, Jim? Take a shit before you get my car, please. After I finished my call to Borg, I spent the drive steeping in my own thoughts. My heart found a new way to break as I sat in silence, knowing I likely wouldn't be seeing Angela again. I never questioned if she was dead or not, but I had become so subconsciously numb that I completely forgot what it was like to hurt. I was actually grateful for the pain, with every tick that increased the number on the odometer, so did my wrath. I didn't even have the urge to stop to get taquitos. I spent 10 years waiting for some sort of closure, and even though I was robbed of an opportunity to say goodbye for a second time, I couldn't help but feel a sense of completion. I know who killed Angela and I was on my way to give him a Borg beatdown. There's no better closure. I may not be able to say goodbye to Angela, but I take great comfort in knowing that I'll be able to say hello again instead. For now, I will allow myself to hurt. It helps chips away at any fears that I may have left. Pull up at Borg's dilapidated ruins. Borg is outside carrying what looks like a large sword as he walls up to the car. Shit, is he gonna fit in this car? Borg, what in the holy hell do you have in your hand? I ask as he packs himself in the front passenger seat. Borg, bring Falchion's sword. Good for murder sport. Borg says with an infectious amount of excitement. You don't think it's overkill? I mean, I have a gun, you know, I reply. Jim have pitiful boomstick. Borg have real weapon. Jim just jealous, Borg says, hauling this ridiculous blade over his shoulder and into the back seat. I drop the topic. Borg, I swallowed loudly as I continued. You wouldn't eat me, would you? Borg like Jim. Borg no eat Jim. Eating Jim be like Jim eat dog, Borg says matter-of-factly. All right, well, I'm glad you find me too adorable to eat, I fire back. I think I was booming laughter, he replies, Jim no cute, Jim just helpless. He laughs harder, clutching his gelatinous gut. All right, control, are you ready to help me in this? Yeah, Jim. Borg and Jim go party now. Borg smiles. Jesus, this is how orcs party. Ogres? I shudder to think what a Borg bachelor party would be like. We spent the ride talking about our plan and construction hacks, all while Borg sharpens his sword. I don't think scraping this thing on a rock actually improved anything. However, I grinned at the idea of Wade suffering at the will of a dull blade. In five miles, take the exit to Fink Road, the GPS chimes. Borg semi-silently lifts his head, looks at the phone, and looks at me. Now we get serious, Jim. He was trying to keep his voice down, but it still failed. I know, Borg, I said, throttling the gas. In a half mile, take exit to Fink Road, the GPS continues. I come off the freeway and start my way down Fink Road. The road is barely paved and unlit. I flip on my high beams and continue speeding my way through the thick darkness. Looking behind me, I can only see a faint glow of my brake lights reflecting off the clouds of dust kicked up behind me. In 25 miles, your destination will be on the right. Borg must have sensed attention and said, Jim, we need talk about plan. Uh-huh, I say keep my eyes on the road. When Borg sees Skinwalker, Borg attack. Borg stab Skinwalker and pin him to ground. Jim shoots Skinwalker knees, 
elbows and eyes if Jim can aim, Borg says as gently as an orc can. Yep, got it. Then what, I ask, still keeping my gaze focused. Jim light Molotov and smash on Skinwalker head. Skinwalker will ignite. Very flammable, Borg replies. Flammable? I ask, puzzled. Yes, Skinwalker afraid of fire because Skinwalker catch fire easy. Borg like to watch. Borg lets out a creepy, thick giggle. That's sick, Borg. I nervously laugh along with him. Seven and a half miles, your destination will be on the right. I feel my knuckles whiten, death gripping the steering wheel. I accelerate to 70 miles per hour. I am so ready for this, I truly look forward to my next burrito, if I can manage to make it out alive. We pull up to a vacant mortuary. No one appeared to be standing outside, no lights were on, and the atmosphere was entirely silent, as if we were standing in zero gravity. Borg reaches into his shirt pocket and pulls out a pair of glasses, taking great care not to scratch the lenses. Great, I say. I'm armed with weapons I've never used, and my backup is a handicapped ogre. Borg not ogre, Borg orc. Jim have handicapped mouth, he barked at me. Alright, I'm sorry, I'm just nervous, I guess, I reply. It's okay, Jim. Please focus, Borg replies with sincerity and confidence. I keep my headlights on and stare at the front door of the mortuary, waiting for this thing to emerge. I almost miss Wade walking out from behind the left-hand side of the building. He was dressed in a pinstripe suit, slick jet black hair, bronze complexion, and a fairly young face. Michael said he was around 150 years old, but... He looked like he was in his early 20s. He stood grinning at me, blocking my gaze. Borg and I look at each other and nod and get out of the car. I swing my backpack over my shoulders and Borg does the same with his falchion sword. We begin walking towards Wade at a cautious pace as he glides towards us, entirely unfettered by our preparedness. We all stop walking at once when we're about 10 feet away from each other. And I say, Wade? My voice is smooth as gravel. Wade opens his arms as if to embrace. Jim! Both Borg and I put one leg back, bending our knees to receive an attack. He puts his hands up and lowers his head slightly. All right, you don't trust me. That's probably wise on your part. Learned a little bit about you. I start in with my infamous false confidence. That you're a skinwalker and not even your own tribe wants anything to do with you. Did you get caught strangling the family pets? I finish satisfied with the low blow, which I could see ticked him off. No, not for strangling the family pets. He started pacing, circling. I didn't see Borg flinch, so I tried to relax as much as possible. Trust that Borg will lead when it's time to move. I can see that you're not entirely certain what a skinwalker is, or you wouldn't be asking me such foolish questions. That is your first mistake. Trust me, pal, I've made many mistakes before this one. Pretty sure a Kelpi popped that cherry for me, I reply with cool ease. Right, he rolls his eyes. Well, a skinwalker is essentially a Navajo medicine man that succumbed to dark magic. He looked up at us, as if expecting some weird withdrawal or newfound fear. Met quite a few beings who could decimate this freak. When Wade doesn't receive his desired reaction, he continues, keeping his hands behind his back and standing up straight. Medicine men have been known to live far beyond the normal expiration of a human. However, medicine men who insist on using dark magic to assert themselves in war? That is greatly frowned upon. My tribe couldn't handle my ideologies, so I was cast out, and you know what? In the most liberating experience I could have been gifted. I roam as I please, I live as I please, and I kill as I please. Gross, I reply, my blood boiling. Borg remains stoic and silent, fixated on our target. He looks so damn cool right now. Wade gets impatient. Child, you either worship me or fear me. The only other option is death. He sneers, his voice starting to gurgle. I'm guessing this is his rendition of wolfing out. I didn't come here with silver bullets and an orc to join your shit show religion, Wade. I yell at him. Years of frustration, pain, and despair have led me to being absolutely fearless and angry. I came here to annihilate you for your crimes against humanity, particularly against my sister. I have literally ghost-toted legendary entities that would serve you up on a slice of toast before morning run. You're just a well-preserved human with magic tricks, I reply with searing vitriol. This does him in, and I finally touched a nerve. You will respect me, he screams in a watery voice. Sounds like something is bubbling up from his throat. His skin begins to turn bright red, and I don't mean his cheeks. Every exposed portion of skin is literally turning red. I can see Borg bracing for something. In turn, I do the same. Looks like the tea is on. Come at me, bitch. If those would have been my last words, that would have been epic. 
The skin and clothing begins to melt from Wade's exterior, revealing dark shade of espresso. I could hear his bones crack and his limbs disjoint until he drops onto all fours with his head down. His roar could only be described as a puma's with the bass cranked all the way up. Once Wade was finished transforming, he slowly lifted his head, and that's when I finally felt dread in his presence. Half his face was occupied by a lipless mouth adorning large pointed teeth. He had small black eyes fitted just above his shapeless nose and long black hair that went down to his waist. I watched his chest heave and fall with every breath as he stared straight at me. Borg snaps into action and darts after Wade, raising his falchion, accidentally smacking me in the face with it. I hit the ground and yelp out like a wounded coyote, holding my face in an effort to quell the ringing in my ears. Borg turns around still holding his sword up. Jim, in a flash, Wade tackles Borg right into the car with enough force to cave the driver's side door in. Broken glass rained on top of them as they struggled. Wade sunk his massive teeth into Borg's shoulder, causing Borg to scream and then release the grip to favor his new wound. As I squint in their direction, I notice that Borg is trying to get on his feet while Wade starts speed crawling towards me. I panic and start scurrying backwards, trying not to look away from this horrifying psycho spider sprinting in my direction. In my sad attempt to back away, I realize that I'm nowhere near my weapons. Fucking oops! I hear Borg stumbling his way towards us, falling to his knees every so often, undoubtedly from the pain. I just had to stall this thing for a few more seconds to allow Borg to catch up. Wade jumps on top of me, sitting on my stomach and squeezing my throat with both hands. He laughs in a very moist, deep and devious manner while I tried clawing at his arms for release. It simply wasn't working. I could hear Borg getting closer, breathing heavy and clearly struggling. I have to do something. And that's why I remembered grabbing the iron nail that Borg had gifted me. I quickly shoved my hand in my pocket, feeling the cold, rough surface of the nail. I yank it out of my pocket and slam it right into Wade's neck, causing him to release his grip and reach for the nail. In that split second, I wiggle from underneath him and Borg grabs Wade by the hair and slams him onto the ground. Borg treated Wade like a ragdoll and kept swinging him around until Wade could no longer move, entirely immobilized and worn out. Borg slammed Wade into the dirt, shoving his falchion through his chest and burrowing the other end into the ground deep beneath him, pinning him in place. Jim, get Molotov, Borg says with exhaustion. I fumble my way into the backpack, pulling out the anarchist grenade, and run over to Wade's body. What's really creepy is he was still breathing, even with a blade buried deep into his chest. He didn't bleed either, like some sort of sentient corn husk doll. I stand over Wade's body and light the Molotov, watching him look up at the sky. He had nothing to say, no fight left to offer. I very nearly felt sorry for him. I raise the Molotov above his head and slam it right into his stomach, his whole body engulfed in a matter of seconds into flames. Borg and I both dropped and sat in silence, panting from the expulsion of adrenaline and newly acquired pain. Are you alright? I asked Borg through deep breaths. Borg fine, he replies, shifting his weight. Thank you, Borg. I couldn't have done that without you. I tried really hard not to tear up, but since Borg and I have already crossed the threshold of leaking bodily fluids a long time ago, I allowed myself to sob. Is okay, Jim, Borg says, gingerly hugging me about as gently as a rusty bear trap. Wade gone. Now Jim can heal inside. He finishes patting me on the back. I lip over to the car and retrieve my phone and realize I have 13 missed calls from Adeline. Here we go. Call her back and she picks up in the middle of first ring. Jim, are you alright? Yeah, I'm okay. Thanks to Borg, of course, I reply. I think that's how a sigh of relief and says, thank goodness. Is Borg okay? Yeah, we need a ride though. What happened to the company car you had for a grand total of six hours? She's furious. So much for being worried about my safety. Well, the driver's side got crushed in the middle of our dispute, I reply, wincing at my own words. She lets out a snort and says, all right, I'm sending a car after you two. Thanks, Adeline, I reply. After this, you won't be hearing from me anymore. I don't think I can work for Cerber any longer. Think again, Jim, she says in a maniacal tone. You now owe me a car. I've already ironed out the kinks with your own car, but you're going to have to stay on with Cerber and regain enough funds to cover the damage to the one you borrowed. Once you repay me for this car, only then will we talk about releasing you from Cerber. Do you understand? She huffs. I guess, I reply with defeat. Good. I'll allow you one week to recover, but then I expect you to be accepting rides immediately after. Oh, and watch your mouth. I'm getting complaints about your attitude from clients, she finishes. Yeah. Okay, sorry. I say, rolling my eyes. Wonderful! replies in her signature bubbly tone. 
Get well soon, Jimmy boy. Thank you for being a loyal employee at Cerber. The line clicks and dies. Damn it. I really need a burrito. All right, so that was a long one, and that was actually a pretty interesting story. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed reading it also. Uh, let me know what you guys thought down in the comments if you actually made it this far. I mean, this, this was a long one. Good lord. Anyways, if you did like, uh, you know, subscribing is a good way to keep up to date on what I post. And liking is, I don't know if I would already said this, pretty good too. Um, yeah, thanks for watching, and I will see y'all in the next one.